My name is Tom Pryor. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Community Church, and uh, I'm speaking this morning, and we are in part four of a message series called Undisturbed. And the series came about because, well, we started a brand new year, and we looked back at 2021, and we're like, what was that? What happened in that year? If we had to summarize 2021 in one word, what would we pick? And uh, we even actually polled people, I think, online via social media, and the responses were interesting. Um, some people were like, uncertainty. That's how I would define 2021. Some people came back with one word that often used four letters that I'm not going to say here. And uh, come see me after if you want to know. Um, but we're thinking, okay, what if this were a year from now? We fast forward, we're in the beginning of 2023. We're looking back at 2022. And if we could choose a word that could define this year, what would we pick? What would we want to define this entire year in our, in our families, in our work, in our marriages, in raising our kids, in our you know, places of business, in our relationships? What would we want to put in this spot? And we kept coming back to this word, peace. Peace. People need, well, at least we think, people really need peace right now. Things are uncertain. Things are kind of wild. This world could use some more peace. Our lives, our families could use more peace. So we started to think, okay, so how do we define peace? And if you look at like the, the Bible, the biblical word for peace comes from a Hebrew word, an ancient Hebrew word, shalom, which you may have heard before. That's used as a greeting, sometimes a salutation or even a blessing, it has this idea of everything in its right place. Everything the way it's meant to be. You know, without any lack for anything, uh, satisfaction is the idea behind that. And when I think of that word, like shalom or peace, I always picture like sitting with my wife at the beach, having eaten some awesome pizza for dinner, and the sun's going down, and it's beautiful. Maybe my kids are there. Um, and if they are, they're eating ice cream and they're quiet and not getting it all over themselves, right? That for me is like, mmm, that is peaceful, it's beautiful. And then we're like, okay, that's pretty good. So then we like, well, what about, what does the dictionary say? What is, how does the dictionary define peace? And what we found is like serenity and stillness, things like that. But there was this other definition that we found to be very interesting, and it was this one. Freedom from disturbance. Freedom from disturbance. As in, it's not so much what is supposed to be in your life, but rather what kind of like isn't. Like you want to get things that disturb our peace out. And for me, like this idea of freedom from disturbance, the, the word picture or something, and this, is, this might be too close to home, too recent, too real. But like I imagine like a yard or a field covered in freshly fallen snow, which some of you are like, why would you bring that up? That's not cool. <laughs> uh, but like the snow, like you know when you, like, you look out and there's no footprints you're right, nobody's shoveled anything yet. The plows haven't come by. There's no snowman, nothing. And it's just beautiful. It's covered like it's undisturbed. And that's where we got the title. The idea is like it's free from disturbances. So then we started asking this question, okay, well then what disturbs our peace? What gets in the way? What, when it shows up, makes peace difficult? So we started going through this. And the first thing we talked about in week one of the series was pride. Pride, when pride wells up, it pushes peace out. When we let pride in, you push peace out. And in week two, we talked about anger. Anger. When anger rises up within us, there's no peace. When you let anger in, you push peace out. The same thing for the week three. We talked about shame. That when shame shows up, this feeling of not being good enough, not worthy of love and acceptance It pushes our peace out. And what's very interesting is not so much the external stimuli. It's something that's outside of us. And we often think like, well, what's bothering my peace? What's getting rid of my peace? You, that thing, my situation. But really, what happens, it's our response. It's what's inside of us that comes up in response to to stimuli. That actually messes up our peace. When we let things like pride, anger, and shame in, we push peace out. Now, this week, uh, I want to talk about another disturbance. Uh, this is something that we all experience at times, um, and, we, and it's experienced, unfortunately, as a weight, something that you carry when it shows up. 
and you take it with you, and it's very portable. You might pick it up in one spot and bring it with you. You might bring it up in your, you pick it up in your 20s and carry, with, carry it with you through the rest of your life. It's a burden. It weighs down on you. It makes us do strange and odd things. It causes us to hide ourselves. It causes us to want to conceal and not let somebody in too close. It causes us to avoid certain people and avoid certain situations because it reminds us of something. The truth is it's often hard to be ourselves when we have this disturbance in our lives. It's hard to be at rest because it disturbs our peace. And this week, what we're talking about is guilt, which I'm sure for a lot of you thinking, I'm so glad I came to church today. <laughs> I was hoping they would talk about guilt. Who, who doesn't want to talk about this? Well, here's the thing. If we want to have a year, if we want to have a year marked by peace, peace on the inside, where it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside, but we can have stillness and rest for our souls, if you will, we need to get rid of this thing. Guilt messes up our peace. It's the emotion associated with realizing we've done something wrong, which by itself, guilt is not necessarily a bad thing. Like when we do something, wrong, when we're at least aware of it, when we realize it, guilt can be very useful. And I dare say, and this might get me in trouble, but I think sometimes guilt actually is a gift from God if we do something with it. But when it's left unresolved, undealt with, when it just sits inside, it's poison and it hurts and it's a weight that robs us of joy. What guilt is often felt as is a debt owed. It's the feeling of a debt owed. Every time you wrong someone, every time you hurt somebody, every time that you mistreat someone, you talk poorly about someone, every time you neglect your family for your career, every time we wrong someone, we hurt someone, we create a debt because every wrongdoing can be restated as a form of theft. You know, if I were to, you know, take my, you know, 100 and whatever, 68 hours a week, and I spend a majority of that time pouring into my career at the expense of my wife and kids, I'm not just like trying to, you know, build a reputation over here, but I am robbing them of robbing my wife of a partner, of a spouse. I'm robbing my kids of father, of a father. I'm robbing all of them of emotional security. I'm robbing them, taking something from them. And then guilt shows up and it starts to tell me over and over that I owe you, I owe them, I owe him, I owe her. What's very interesting is that this word owe, if you look at like the etymology, the origin of that word in our English language, it comes from this idea of possession, that when you hurt someone and guilt shows up and it makes you feel like you owe, it's because you then possess something that isn't yours, that you feel compelled to pay back, to give back. And the sad part is, and you know this, because I'm sure you've been hurt and wrong before, there's nothing people can do to really pay back exactly. You can't get the time back. When, you, when your reputation is messed up, no, no words can earn that back to exactly the way that it was. If you've been cheated on, there's no way they can pay back all of the emotion spent, all of the time spent building that relationship. But there's a debt, and it's a crushing weight that weighs upon us, and we call it guilt. The problem is with guilt, as I said before, is that it's un when it's left unresolved, it lingers and becomes poison, and it causes us to avoid, it causes us to hide, it causes us to conceal. And when that happens, what we say is that when you let guilt in, you push peace out, but further than that, worse than that, when you keep guilt in, you keep peace out. So, what do we do? What can we do about this? I think there is indeed a remedy for our guilt, which is really, really good news, uh, but it is inconvenient, it is really uncomfortable, and requires to be quite vulnerable. And probably some of you are already thinking about what I'm talking about, and you're right. What you need to do is pack up your stuff, dye your hair, get to New Mexico, see this guy named Edgar. He's going to give you a brand new passport and a whole new life, and you never have to see those people ever again, and you can move on. 
that's really corny, I'm sorry. Uh, no, um, but the truth is it is uncomfortable. It will require vulnerability and it's not convenient. And it's found in the words of a guy named John. John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. He traveled with Jesus. He was there and watched this guy just minister to people and take care of people and serve those who were on the fringes of society. He loved those that were deemed unlovable. And what John came to find was that Jesus was not just some like religious leader, not just some good teacher, but this may seem crazy. He found that Jesus was indeed who he said he was, that he was the son of God. John started to believe, to know, and to trust Jesus, this guy he was following, as his Lord and as his savior. And so he wrote some things down, and we're going to take a look at it. But before we get there, I want to ask this question again. If you could have peace this whole year, what would you be willing to do? Would you be willing to take what John has to say and run with it? This is what John says. If we confess our sins, we confess our sins. Now, some of you are thinking, no surprise, okay, I get it, confession, okay, I'm all, I get it, fine, we confess our sins. Well, what does this mean really? We're not, <laughs> we're not revealing any secrets to God, but rather when we admit, when we acknowledge when we declare the truth about how we aren't right all the time, how we've messed up, how we've done wrong, how we've hurt people, especially the people we love and we care about that are closest to us, when we are real about our wrongdoings, when we own what we have done wrong, it says that he, God, is faithful and just, meaning he's, he's dependable. We can trust him, and it's true. It's authoritative. What is that? that he's forgiving us our sins. The idea is that when we go to God, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us and wipe away the weight of that guilt. And then furthermore, he goes on and it says he'll purify us of all unrighteousness. He will restore us to a place that we were meant to be before the wrongdoing, that he can bring us back to being new and whole and the way that God designed for us to be, but it requires that we be real about our stuff. Now, there's a guy, uh, another New Testament author named Paul. Now, Paul was not always known as the Apostle Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament. He was known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a well-educated, well-respected Jewish leader in the first century. And this guy knew guilt. He knew what guilt was, but he wrote something that goes along this that I think is incredible. He says this. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is, if you are in Jesus, that is, if you go to God and confess, and we can only go to God because of Jesus, but that's a conversation for another day. But when we go to God and own our stuff, we don't have to walk around guilty. In fact, there is no condemnation. There's no sense of dread and weight that we have to bear because we are forgiven. And the guy that wrote this, Paul, like I said, he knew guilt. He was like a, he even says it in one of his letters, he's like, he was like the Jew of Jews. He knew every letter of the law and he enforced it to such a degree that when Christianity showed up, when Jesus showed up in the scene, he was so protective of the Hebrew faith that he would hunt down, track down, and jail followers of Jesus. He would hunt them down, track them down, and imprison them, torture them, and sometimes be responsible for their execution. He was responsible for people's deaths. And then later in his life, he had this miraculous encounter with God where he himself became a follower of Jesus. He became one of the people he used to hunt down. Could you imagine the amount of guilt this guy felt? Becoming somebody he used to hate. And now he carried that. But in God's arms, he found forgiveness. And he could write with a somehow a clear conscience, even when he traveled to places where he probably met folks related to, connected to the people he jailed, tortured, and executed, he could, he could say that somehow there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. You see, guilt 
is this huge feeling of a debt owed, but forgiveness is the freeing of that debt owed. In other words, what God says is this. You are guilty, as in, you don't have to deny it, you don't have to be defined by it, but you are guilty. You did do wrong, but I do not condemn you. You are not condemned. In other words, when God looks at Paul and John and you and I, he says this, when I see you, I don't see that. When you, when you might think of, of yourself as the person who hurt your siblings, who abandoned the family, who've damaged the reputations of others, God says, when I see you, I don't see that. And I don't want you to see that anymore. You can put the weight down. You can let go of the guilt and be free. For some of us today, that is what you needed to hear. That is why you came here today, because you need to know that if you confess, if you can go to God and be real, you can find forgiveness. You can find freedom. You can find acceptance and wholeness. But there's probably a bunch of us in here thinking, okay, Tom, I've heard that before. I've been going to church for a long time. Like, this is not a new idea. This is like, churches say this all the time. Like, why is it that I can't seem to pray away the guilt? I go to God. I confess all the time. Confession's a part of my life. Why do I still feel guilty? Why is it still, there's still a knot in my stomach? And I think I know why, but let me, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Uh, imagine, um, I'm going to tell you an imaginary story, a scenario. So I work here full time. Uh, Lou works here full time. Let's imagine that I leave my wallet on my desk and uh, he's looking for me. He goes to my office and I'm not there for some reason and he sees my wallet. And for whatever reason, he decides to pull a whole bunch of $100 bills out of my wallet. Let me remind you, this is an imaginary story. I don't have that much money. Um, so he takes the money and he disappears and goes in his truck and just, you know, goes somewhere. Hours later, he comes back. I realize there's money missing and I see him and he's wearing some brand new kicks. He's got some new sneakers, a hat, I don't know, some gold chains. I don't know. Like he just doesn't look like him. And he's like, I'm like, yo, what's the deal? What are you doing? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. Um, listen. I know that was yours. I shouldn't have taken it, but I, I went to God and I confessed and I was real about my stuff and I found that God was faithful and just and forgiving and purifying me of all unrighteousness and now we're good. I'm like, mm, hold on. No, we're not good yet. And he's like, no, no, listen, man. I'm just living in grace. I'm just living in God's grace. We're fine. I'm like, you better keep praying, but this time for protection because I'm going to attack you. Like, <laughs> Clearly, something's left undone. And often that what's left undone still brings about not the condemnation that we might be talking about, like that sense of guilt, like, ugh, why do I still feel this way? And I think this is why. And to, to make sense of it, I want to talk about a guy named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, we find him in the Gospel of Luke. And to give you a little backstory here, uh, Luke was one of the New Testament writers. He, he, he was not a disciple of Jesus, but he f followed or listened to and wrote down stuff that he heard from people who were close followers of Jesus. And he created this account that we call the Gospel of Luke. And he introduces us, this guy named Zacchaeus. Now, the setting where Zacchaeus is introduced, Jesus is in the town of Jericho, and he's trying to get through the town. But like so many times in Jesus' life, there's a lot of people following him. There's a lot of people who want his attention or at least want to see him, to listen to him, to hear what he has to say about life, about faith, about God. And it's a lot of times it's things they've never heard before or put in a way that's like eye-opening to them. So there's a crowd and Jesus is like, I don't know if you said this, but he just wants to get through the town and there's all these people. And that's when we're introduced to Zacchaeus. And we're told that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, was really wealthy, and he was short. So while trying to see Jesus, he could not see over the heads of the crowd. So he climbs up into a sycamore tree so that he can hang out on some of the branches and see above the crowd so that he might be able to actually get a glimpse of or see Jesus. So that's the scene. That's what's going on here. And then Luke tells us what happens. 
He says, when Jesus reached the spot, that is the tree that Zacchaeus was in, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And Zacchaeus responds with, he came down at once immediately and welcomed Jesus gladly. Now, there is a lot going on in this scene in such a few sentences. You have to remember that Zacchaeus, like I had mentioned, he was a tax collector. He was wealthy. And that had a lot of implications for his life. So first, he was a Jewish guy living amongst the Jewish people in that was under, if you will, the Roman government, under their rule. And tax collectors would often take money from their fellow people and keep a portion as commission for themselves and send the rest as taxes to the government, which the Jews didn't like because they didn't like Rome and they sure didn't like their other Jewish people taking their money. But Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector and was really, really wealthy, which meant he was very good at his job, which means that he was hated. He was despised. So much so that like tax collectors wouldn't even be placed in the group of bad people known as sinners. They actually would say like, this guy's a sinner, but that guy's a tax collector. It was so much worse to be a tax collector than just a plain old sinner. And this guy was one of them, which is probably why, being short, he didn't go through the crowd to see Jesus. He probably would have gotten pummeled. Instead, he avoids the crowd. He distances himself from the people, climbs a tree to see Jesus. And then, and we don't, we don't know what Zacchaeus or the people necessarily thought of Jesus at this point. We don't know if they saw him as just a rabbi, a leader in the religious, you know, the faith, or perhaps the son of God or a prophet. But Jesus starts to go through this crowd, stops at the tree, makes eye contact, says the guy's name, and says, come down. I want to stay at your house. I want to be subject to your hospitality. I want you to be my host. And for the crowd, they must have blown their minds for this religious leader, this man of the faith, to even associate, to even be seen near Zacchaeus. But instead, not just that, he calls him by name and says, I want to be in your household. I want to be friends with you. I want to be like you and I, we're cool. And immediately, all of the guilt, all of the shame is dealt with. He's forgiven. He's accepted. This one act tells Zacchaeus and tells the crowd that God is cool with Zacchaeus, that he's okay, that he's guilty but not condemned, that when Jesus looks at Zacchaeus. He doesn't see all the folks that hate his guts. They don't see that when Jesus looks at him, he doesn't see the guy that stole from his people and benefited himself to give to Rome. He sees Zacchaeus plainly. And that pushed and kicked out his guilt so that peace could move back in. The story continues. And uh, it's kind of interesting because <laughs> You would think perhaps the people are like, whoa, we've never seen this before. A religious person like taking a risk to like befriend somebody like this. But it says this, all the people saw this and they began to mutter. They were upset. They weren't happy about this. Jesus is breaking the rules. You don't associate with people like this. They started to say he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus, how could you do this? You're going to dirty yourself. You're going to ruin your reputation. You're making it bad for everyone here. And I love what happens next. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, look, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Immediately he's like, look, look, I understand that I have wronged people. But this guy, Jesus, is like, yo, we're cool. I'm not sure, but I think maybe God is okay with me. Like he accepts me for who I am. And I'm not going to let it stop here. I am going to make it right with everyone that I have wronged. I will give away half of my stuff. I won't just do what the law asks me of. I won't just give back and 20% on top. I'll do way more than that. I want to give back four times as much because I want to make it right. My forgiveness compels me to move forward, to seek and make 
reconciliation, to make restitution, to make amends with the people that I've wronged. And I don't know if they're going to accept me. I don't know if they're going to reject me. They might be like, don't show your face here, Zacchaeus. You want to give me something? Get out of here. I never want to see your face again. But instead, he's like, no, no, no. I have to go make it right. I want to make it right. This forgiveness, this wholeness, this acceptance that I feel cannot end with me. I want to make it right. And then Jesus responds with this. He says, today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. And that comment wasn't even for Zacchaeus. That was for everyone else. That's for you and me. He's like, you want to know what it means to be like a God person, to be a religious person, to be a son or a daughter of Abraham, which we don't fully understand all the, 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 the meaning behind that. But the idea is like, you want to know how to be a good God-fearing person, a good Christian, whatever it might be, you do it this way because Zacchaeus gets it. When you realize that you don't have to carry this burden, this weight, this guilt around, when you're freed from the condemnation, it doesn't stop with you because then you have the ability, the motivation, the impetus to go and make it right with other people. And we don't know, like I said, we don't know if it worked, if people still hated Zacchaeus, right? But he wanted to make it right. And I'm sure, I'm sure when he did that, guilt was pushed out and peace filled his life. There's another New Testament writer. His name is James. He was the brother of Jesus. And he, he said this about going to one another. He said, confess your sins to one another, to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And there's a lot of things we could talk about. What does it mean by healing? Does it mean like a physical healing? But I think this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that God is faithful and just and purifying. We will find restoration and healing for our souls when we go and try to make it right. You see, we go to God for forgiveness. And then we can go to others for reconciliation. We don't try to make it right to become forgiven. That doesn't work. We can't pull it off for ourselves, but instead, we just go to God and confess and be real and own our part. He's faithful and just and will forgive. And once we understand that the condemnation is gone and dealt with, we can then go make it right with other people. And we don't know what hangs in the balance for ourselves, for other folks. Let me tell you a short story. It's a story I've told before. Uh, years ago, like coming up on 20 years ago, which is a wild idea, um, I was in this like, I don't know, worship band. There was a bunch of young guys. We were trying to put together songs like we do here so that we could help churches and their youth groups and whatever. We spent the summer like rehearsing and traveling a little bit in New York mostly. And uh, at one point we we're like, you know, maybe we should record some of these songs. And we had... One guy wrote a couple of original tunes. We spent a summer like putting this all together. Well, at the end of it all, the guy that had the original tunes said he wanted to take all of it for himself, like he was going to try to use it to jumpstart his career, which the truth is it wasn't going to happen. Like we weren't that good. But the point was like there was four other guys besides this dude, me being one of them, and we put all this time and this energy into this project, and one guy was like, listen, I'm just going to take all of it for me. It was not pretty. I was really, really ticked off, very angry. And I, if I'm vulnerable with you guys, I carried a grudge against this guy for a decade. My relationship with him was severed. Like, we were not on speaking terms. If anybody brought up his name, I was just like, oh, you want to know about him? I'll tell you about him. You know what he did? Like, I was not great with it. So 10 years go by. Hopefully, we're adults at this point. Um, he messaged me, I think through Facebook or whatever, he uh, invited me to come to his old church where he and his wife uh, were going to have like an album release event where they were going to play some songs. And then he actually invited me after that to his parents' house for like the after party hangout. And at that party, he approached me and he said, listen, I know that what I did was wrong and I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done what I did. I shouldn't have taken, tried to take those things from you, from the other guys, and I'm really sorry. I hope that you can forgive me. And I turned and looked at him, 
and I wound up a big old, no, I, um, I accepted his apology. I said, of course I forgive you. Thank you. Thank you for saying sorry. And I have to apologize. I'm like, I've been carrying some anger towards you for 10 years. And I'll tell you, this is a success story, but I'll tell you that this brought healing to my life. And in preparation for this message, I was thinking, man, this also brought healing to his life. Because for 10 years, every time somebody mentioned his name, I was like, but imagine him. 10 years, if if something about me comes to his mind, somebody says something about me, what does he think? For 10 years, he avoided. 10 years, he carried this weight, this burden, knowing he had done wrong. And then finally, he owned it. What's interesting is that we were both like Christian guys. We knew about the confession part. We knew about going to God for for forgiveness. And yet he came to me and the guilt in his life and the anger in my life, both of them were pushed out and peace moved back in. So, who's coming to mind for you right now? I'm sure there's somebody who keeps coming up, and it's, I'm not trying to guilt you into it. I think that, you know, if they're coming to mind, because God wants you to do, wants to do something with that guilt. And if you go to try to make reconciliation, know that you are forgiven first by God, and know that the outcome isn't on you. Because it's so tempting to try to go and be like, mm, well, if I think about it, I don't think they're gonna receive me well. I know they're gonna still be angry, so it's probably not gonna work out, so I'll just won't. It's easy to talk ourselves out of trying to make the effort. But here's the thing. When we go, the outcome's not up to us. That's up to God. But when we go, we will find that guilt will have no hold over us and peace will move back in. Because what disturbs our peace? Guilt. Guilt disturbs our peace, disturbs your peace. So let's have a year marked by confession, by forgiveness, a reconciliation, so we can have a year of peace.